Hello, this is Abdul Fatih reporting for TFIR from this beautiful town of Sonoma, California. We are here at the Open Source Leadership Summit and we have met a lot of technologists and business leaders. So let's go and meet our next guest. So we are here at you know, Open Source Leadership Summit. Sonoma. Sonoma. With beautiful weather, what more could we ask for? Open source, beautiful weather, Sonoma, doesn't get better than this. Well, no. Right. So what are you doing here? <laughs> Taking a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everybody is. <laughs> I'm coming to Open Source Leadership Summit, which means, you know, I'm going to hang out at the spa. I'm going to wander around, drink some wine. In the morning? <laughs> That's what they said when I checked in. Would you like a glass of champagne? I'm like, it's a little, it's 10, 30. I'm, I'm good right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'll chip back in a couple of hours. <laughs> nice, nice. But anyway, beyond wine and drinking and weekend <laughs> anything to do with work or club, anything. I'm always on Cloud Foundry. I live and breathe Cloud Foundry. That's why I call you cloud, uh, queen of the cloud, right? I think that's true. Do you like true. that? I don't know if anybody else should be the queen of the cloud. You're the one, right? I'm it. Right. So so what, what, what is Cloud Foundry doing at this uh, leadership summit? Because I was sitting through the uh, Jim's keynote and he was like, you know, we are going to details. It's not about we just, you know, everybody collaborate and shares everything. So, so I mean, from Cloud Foundry's perspective and Open Source Leadership Summit. What, what? Well, I think this really brings together a lot of my favorite things in one spot. Mm -hmm. uh, the power of open source. The mm -hmm. Open Source Leadership Summit really brings together the leaders in open source, which are really fundamentally changing the world. I mean, I know you've been a longtime follower of open source, mm -hmm. but open source is in its moment right now. Right. We are collectively, we are driving and changing industries, and particularly with cloud. If you look at um, the Linux Foundation as a whole, it's got basically every fundamental aspect of cloud that's part of the open source project. You have mm -hmm. Cloud Foundry Foundation, you've got Cloud Native Computing Foundation, you've got mm -hmm. the Open Computing Initiative. And then let's really extend that to um, even the open networking solutions that are really the underpinnings of how this is all going to work. So we actually are now looking for the first time at the full stack in open source around cloud and the enablement of organizations to take advantage of cloud. And I think that actually puts us at a, a really interesting moment in time. Right. I recall uh, early days after my, I finished my journalism, I you know joined Linux Free Magazine Group. And uh, back in 2004, we were, the whole education, the messaging was more about uh, uh, telling people the advantages of open source, why you should use open source. Fast forward to 2018, everybody's using open source these days. But the new challenge is that those people actually don't know how it works. You also come across a lot of companies who are new to it. So what kind of you know, challenge do you see out there? Well, I see it as a challenge, but also an opportunity. Exactly. You know, every for open source. Mm -hmm. We have 40% of our members are, are end users. Mm -hmm. um, the highest that any open source project, I believe, has. Mm -hmm. And for many of our end user members, this is the first time they've been part of an open source project. Companies like Home Depot and American Airlines, those aren't companies you traditionally think of that are really um, openly involved in open source, and yet here they are. They're here, they're participating, they are becoming contributors. This is where I see the future of open source going. So beyond the technology companies, beyond the technology providers, but really also pulling in collaboratively the end users that want to have a say in where and shape where the future of that technology goes, that they're banking the future of their companies on. Right, right. They are no more consumer. They can, you know, they are active contributor and, you know, they participate in it actively, you know. Exactly. And that's yeah. what's so exciting about open right. source and the digital transformation initiatives that are going on right now is these companies are, are really rethinking how technology is part of their company. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, they're taking advantage of that. They're saying, Cloud Foundry is helping me transform my company, mm -hmm. but open source is allowing me to also shape the future of my company. Right. And it puts that control back in their hands. And that's that's been really part and parcel of Cloud Foundry. Mm -hmm. Cloud Foundry is the platform to enable their transformation, but the open source piece allows them to really embrace that mm -hmm. and be in control and shape the future of their technology and their company at the same time. Right. With open source, one more thing is happening is that since there are a lot, so many uh, players coming in, so many new ideas, they're trying to solve new problems. So the uh, as a journalist, I kind of struggle to keep up with so much is happening. So so from uh, first of all, from Cloud Foundry's perspective, what what news is going on there? So much is going on. Um, obviously, uh, Kubo, which became Cloud Foundry's Container Runtime the end mm -hmm. of last year, 
Though I actually inter- that Cuba name was cute. It's cute. C- it is super cute. Yeah. Um, but in those of you that have children will realize maybe it might have some trademark potential trademark <laughs> infringement issues with Disney. <laughs> but um, Kubo is cute. Kubernetes on Bosch. We uh, renamed it Cloud Foundry Container Runtime because there was a lot of confusion around what does Kubernetes mean? Why? How do you run that alongside what we thought of as Cloud Foundry, which at the time was Elastic Runtime? So what we did was we renamed mm-hmm. things. So we have application runtime, which is really focusing on the elastic runtime capabilities and offering that, you know, click to push app um, opportunity alongside container runtime, mm-hmm. which giving you the chance to run right. those containerized workloads in tandem with um, your your more cloud native applications. And I think that really gives you a much more inclusive experience with Cloud Foundry. And I think in 2018 we'll see a lot more of that. You know, one of our key guiding principles for 2018 is interoperability, and you're going to hear me talk a lot about that this year. Building bridges to other projects, technologies, Mm -hmm. communities, other open source projects, and really taking advantage of these amazing new technologies that are coming. Kubernetes was one of them, but um, look at the amazing traction that's going on with Envoy and Istio, or even the great work with CSI, the Container Storage Interface. You know, last year we integrated CNI, the Container Networking Interface, into Cloud Foundry. We also integrated OCI, the Run C that came from the Open Container Initiative. So you're going to see a lot more of that from us this year because Cloud Foundry is an amazingly mature um, and, and evolving technology. But more importantly, it needs to continue to evolve. And right. there's so many interesting projects and technologies that are going on and out there. And you know, it would within open source, what's the value of that? We can take advantage of all of these things mm-hmm. and really collaborate more deeply with all of these other projects. Right. Uh, well, well, you're talking about uh, all these uh, integration. With the, so is it like driven by the vendors or is there is demand you know, from the market that you, you see there is a problem, you can solve it in a better way? All of the above, right? Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, a, a technology is only as good as its ability right. to keep up and evolve and grow. Right. Um, a, you know, the second you stop moving, mm-hmm. it's like a shark. The second you stop right. swimming, you start dying. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to really think about that with Cloud Foundry, is that it needs to continue to evolve, um, just like our ecosystem needs to continue to evolve, mm-hmm. and our users need to continue to grow. We all need to continue to grow. And mm-hmm. the amazing thing about open source is we can do that all together. Mm-hmm. CNC have just gave a definition for serverless. Oh, I thought you were going to say blockchain for a second. Oh, we can talk about that. <laughs> You can you can invade into an, any, any territory. That's totally fine. You're the queen of the cloud. <laughs> I feel like we're like we're blockchain. I mean, we can't have any conversation that doesn't yeah. involve cloud that doesn't involve blockchain, uh-huh. serverless, uh-huh. and AI. <laughs> yeah. So so serverless is kind of becoming because they just CNCF just kind of gave a definition through the white paper. Yeah. I saw so that. W- 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 what role is uh, cloud for, for, for probably playing there in this space? I think you know we're getting there. I think we're we're able to support serverless now. Um, you know, we've seen IBM really lead the way with OpenWhisk, and um, you know, you're starting to see some of the work that Google's doing with functions. And I think serverless is really growing beyond just the you know the early concepts with Lambda. When we look at Cloud Foundry, it was you're making it easier, you know, for developers to not worry about you know all the other things. Yeah. Serverless, you know, or function as service, they just like okay, you don't have to worry about anything. That you know, you just like run that function and you're done. So from you know, from how do you see it in evolution or? Well, I think serverless, yeah, you run your function, you're done. Yes. Your work is done. Yes. There's other stuff underneath there. That's going on, yes. And not everything <laughs> and the same can with be Cloud Foundry. Yes. You like your CF push your app and mm. your work is done, but there's stuff going on underneath there. There's still platform, there's still infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I've really always hated the moniker serverless because I'm like, well, there's still servers there. Is, there's still a server there, yeah. <laughs> there's somebody's got somebody's yeah. maintaining what's underneath that. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think there is a lot of potential with serverless. Um, you know, think about the functions as a service and the ability to write these small microservices. I mean, it's just an extension mm-hmm. of the microservices architecture and the way you think about that. Um, but it's still early days. Right. Yeah, we're talking about it. Yeah. But keep in mind that most enterprise organizations are still trying to figure out what cloud native means for them. Uh, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And I think we're, we're still, you know, organizations are still getting familiar with containers, mm-hmm. containerized oh, workloads, yes. mm-hmm. cloud native application architectures. And I think there will be an opportunity, but you know, I think we all agree that a you know serverless or functions as a service or those small apps aren't the solution to everything. No, mm-hmm. they are. They're a finite use case, and so I think when we think about cloud native taking a step back, serverless is part of that continuum. Right. But so are a, a lot of other applications, and so we need to look at the whole continuum of opportunity. 
that's why I think cloud native is so important as we talk about what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does cloud native mean? What does cloud mean and how do we take advantage of that? You mentioned some technologies. The funny thing is that these technologies are like less than four or five years old. What do you mean? They're less than like two years old. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm talking Docker or Kubernetes and all those, which are like major. Docker's uh, yeah. 2013. Yeah, yeah. so uh, it's, they're very new technology. People are still trying to, you know, kind of understand. And it's breaking the whole old legacy model, you know, 20 years and you're still, you know, running the same application. Uh, so, so what really matters more? To look at it from the cloud native perspective that, you know, okay, this is what, you know, we should be looking at, then everything else falls in place, or they should look at, you know, oh, functions are a new buzzword, let's see what it is. What yeah. is cloud native, you know, in a, in a way, that how does everything else fall into the picture? I think cloud native, for me, represents the ability to take advantage of something we've been talking about since 2007. Right, right. We've been talking about the magic of cloud in 2007. Remember all the things cloud was going to do for I know, us? Yes. It was going to take care of business continuity. It was going to take care of disaster recovery. You're going to auto scale. It was elastic. You could like move things around. Turns out you also have to architect your applications to do that too, yes. which we just figured out what that means. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that the 12 factor app you know, manifesto hasn't been out there since I think 2007, 2008 when Heroku mm -hmm. wrote it. Mm -hmm. But I think people are just really starting to grok what that means and how to take advantage of that because it isn't just about writing small stateless applications. What it really represents when we talk about cloud native is the larger process, the larger continuum, uh, continuous delivery, mm -hmm. right? Writing small applications that you can iterate on building organizationally those cross-functional teams with common business um, outcomes and really aligning your structure around that. The technology piece, frankly, is the easiest part in all of this. But seeing organizations build those cross-functional agile teams, building continuous delivery pipelines, um, iterating quickly on apps, tying their product and their outcome closely to business feedback and those product teams, and building those, those streams in place that's the big work. Mm -hmm. And really articulating that the power of technology enables those practices, it doesn't solve for everything. Right. You know, Cloud Foundry does an amazing job of that, but Cloud Foundry by itself will not do that. Mm -hmm. Cloud Foundry will not allow you to take application development lifecycle from nine months down to every day magically by itself. Mm -hmm. It is basically a, an enabler and a reminder of those good practices, but you still have to put the work in. Uh, uh, so it's more like uh, technology versus culture, you know. So is there anything that Cloud Foundry, because Cloud Foundry, if you look at it, you know, you have Pivotal, VMware, Dell, you know, it's like a big, you know, <laughs> it's hard to say, you know. SAP, how, IBM, yeah, everything is connected. Say, Cisco. So, so how do you do anything to actually help companies in the changing the culture or actually anything that you do at that level? I mean, you come to these events and talk to a lot of people, but beyond that, how do you play a role in changing the culture, not just offering them technology? I think a lot of companies do a great job of doing that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you named off you know, a lot of companies that are really focusing on that, Pivotal, Dell, you know, the Dell tech companies, Pivotal, VMware, Dell EMC, um, but IBM, mm -hmm. you know, Cisco, SAP, um, SUSE, all of these companies are, are really investing in providing that. I mm -hmm. think. For me, I'm just a pragmatist. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I can sit here and talk all day about the wonders and magic of open source and Cloud Foundry, and I think Cloud Foundry technically is an amazing platform. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a pragmatist in, certain, in understanding that why people adopt it and use it. And people right. adopt it and use it because they're doing that. And they're trying to make that change. And if we're collectively thinking about any of our technologies, particularly things that enable cloud native adoption, we need to understand that there is a culture shift that is part of right. that for end users. Right. And for me, I've always been an end user advocate. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been customer facing my entire right. career. Uh, and so for me, I'm always like, okay, this is great tech. Who's using it? Why are they using it? And what is the point of it? And right. how do we keep that front and center of our conversation? D does Cloud Foundry also run any kind of certification program or training programs also? To yes, help? great question, Swapnil. <laughs> <laughs> we have a platform certification which the whole point of having a platform certification is just really conformance around what Cloud Foundry mm -hmm. means and that open source. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also offer training and certification. And we launched that last June. Mm -hmm. And what's so great about the training and certification program is beyond that it teaches you how to run cloud, how to run and take advantage of all the amazing capabilities within Cloud Foundry, 
It also teaches you how to write cloud native applications, cloud native best practices, how to run and scale applications um, in an enterprise at this scale. Mm -hmm. And I think fundamentally, even if you choose not to, to you know, use Cloud Foundry forever, which I don't know why you wouldn't, but in the event you don't, you still walk away with those best practices. And right. I think at the end of the day, when we talk about cloud native, it's understanding how a cloud works, understanding how high automation works and pipelines work, and then taking advantage of that with uh, the way you're writing your application. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you would like to add? Um, I am super bullish on where things are going. Mm -hmm. But I also am really optimistic about the role that end users are going to play in this conversation going forward. Okay. Uh, as we are kind of going through this, you know, uh, everything is becoming software defined. You know, everything is data driven, moving API to cloud. API driven. Everything yes. is. So, so what role is you know open source going to play in this? Uh, and one more thing that this revolution is not just about technology; it's changing the way we interact with each other, our lives, our society. Everything is being transformed. We never imagined uh, this no. kind of ever. So, uh, but the funny thing is that open source is, is at the you know kind of bedrock. You know, it's the foundation of this whole. From your perspective, what do you think? What role is open source going to play in this revolution? I think it's going to play a bigger role than we all give it credit for, mm -hmm. because. Yes, the way we interact with technology is different, but our expectations are different. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't that long ago that you bought software, you bought hardware, and you wrote it out. Mm -hmm. You were with that, you were married to that for the next 20 years. 20 years yeah. And you made technology changes very slowly. Um, you know, the famous eight year hardware cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Every eight years, it's time to refresh, right? And um, now, and I, and I really think this changed when, you know, the iPhone came out. And mm -hmm. not just the iPhone, but the App Store and the transparency and the accessibility to data really changed our perspectives because now if you don't have immediate access to data, mm -hmm. what do you think? You're frustrated. Right. If you go to your bank's mobile app and it's, it says, oh, we have an, a site outage tonight, we're taking it down. You're like, what? Why would you do that? Yes. And, it, and it's, whereas 10 years ago, that was totally fine. Oh, yeah. Website was down on a Saturday night for maintenance. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, our expectation of always having access to that data and that information is changing the way we think about technology mm -hmm. because you expect that visibility and you expect that constant change. You expect things to keep up. You expect things to keep pace. And so with open source, you can do that. With open source, you can say, hey, you know what? I really wish that this technology did this. I wish it supported that. Great. Submit a pull request. You can now make that a reality. And I think that is really, I think, I think it is no coincidence mm -hmm. that open source, the rise of open source, the prevalence of open source alongside the digital transformation movement, alongside the fourth industrial revolution where we're actually becoming much more accustomed to the day-to-day -day right. integrations with technology. I don't think it's a coincidence that all three of those things are happening at the same time. And the, from the cultural perspective, because now in the early days, companies were com competing, you know, they have their own you know, kind of guarded secrets. Now, if you come to this event, Microsoft, Red Hat, Cloud Foundry, and all the pivotal, uh, I, Dell, no matter who you name, everybody's in the same box. Facebook and Google, they sit together with Twitter. So it's also changing the way you know, technology is being developed where people are interacting with each other. So that will also bring a shift in the whole, I mean, the way we develop technology and new things. Well, yeah, because it's, it's understanding what is table stakes, right? Mm -hmm there is no longer the point of recreating the same technology over and over again because that's not differentiating. Right. You know, there's a certain amount of, of baseline, you know, table stakes in tech that you have to have. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense to collaborate on that and share that cost of that and share the R&D and share the innovation around that and then building differentiation on top of that. Mm -hmm. That's a much better use of time and money than saying, well, you know, so-and-so's got this, so let me create the same thing over here. And this tech company B over here has got this, so let me recreate that over here. And you're like, well, that's just wasting time and right. money. And particularly when you start talking about large, powerful platforms like Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry right. is very big, it's very complex. It took many years to get it to the point where it is today. And that isn't something that you're gonna easily reproduce with a, a team of three yes. in, in, a, in, a, in a six month span. And I think taking advantage of these large innovative movements like Cloud Foundry, like Kubernetes, um, these are fundamental things that it doesn't make sense for you to rebuild that right. 
but instead build things on top of that that really change your business. Awesome. Uh, I think we talked about a lot of things and we can continue Anything talking. else? Come on. We haven't, we haven't even talked about AI or machine learning or blockchain or the, the magic of... Um, yeah, we can talk about everything. <laughs> machine learning is really going to be very, very interesting uh, because... Uh, it will be. It is. Uh, so what's going on from the Cloud Foundry's perspective? Because machine learning, you know, as a science fiction writer, I used to think machine learning means artificial intelligence, deep learning, but it's helping the stack itself becoming more smarter and... Uh, yeah, I think Cloud Foundry provides fundamentals for that. Mm -hmm. I think we're all excited about the potential for AI and ML. I think I personally am excited to see basic integrations from an API standpoint of data that already exists, mm -hmm. like data my phone has. Right. There's small tweaks that if you integrated the data my phone already has on me, that you could do, like, hey, I know you're supposed to be here at this time. Uh, let me go ahead and call an Uber for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> or, you know, hey, I know this is, there's somebody's birthday is coming up tomorrow. Let me, you know, remind you and order a gift for you or something yeah. like that. There's little small tweaks, I think, that we're, that we can really integrate into the existing data points we have, but it just, the fundamentals are not there yet. We're getting close mm. to, to that. But, you know, we talk a lot about AI and ML, but we're, we're, we've missed the point where these companies also have to understand cloud native right. before yes. they get that. You have mm. to walk before you can run. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of fundamentals you need to bring in. If you're developing applications that take advantage of, of machine learning or, or AI algorithms, you also need to have small stateless apps that yes. you can iterate mm -hmm. on that scale microservices you need to have you know cd pipelines you need to have all of those fundamentals in place and and it's the same with serverless you like mm -hmm. you don't just go straight into to adopting these technologies at scale right you need to really walk before you get there right right uh, yeah and it's uh, uh Medical, you know, you can have uh, you ha can have people's medical record. Then you know, genome mapping is there, so you put it together. So diabetes type two, it, you know, you can find a solution to that. So machine learning can help and all those things. I think machine learning is going to fundamentally change yes. life in our generation, mm -hmm. um, and particularly in our children's generation. I think it will absolutely will have a a prevailing role. But I also think we need to one figure out how we adopt those technologies. Mm -hmm. And then, frankly, um, just from a pure personal standpoint, I do worry a little bit about cognitive bias. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, who's really developing these algorithms um, and making sure that we don't put too much trust in algorithms just yet. Well, yeah, there are concerns, so. And, and they're valid, too. Yeah, I think we have a lot of systemic issues in our industry that um, we want to make sure that that doesn't perpetuate into um, lifelong algorithms. Yeah. We'll see what happens. <laughs> then we'll, we'll we'll come up with something else to fight that. That will be an ongoing process, you know, forever. Yes. Uh, anything else? I think we have covered a lot of things today. And uh, once again, you know, nice nice talking to you. Always a pleasure.